Good evening and welcome to the public lecture, a return to basic research in the study of democracy. My name is Alice al uh, and as a co-organizer of this event, along with my colleagues uh, Palmo Bruna, Henri-Pierre Mottironi and Deborah Calte, um, which are from the Association of Researchers in Democracy Studies, uh, Democracy Net, it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight uh, and I look forward to a very interesting evening. This lecture is part of a two, day research, two days research workshop titled Democratic Participation, Theoretical and Empirical Perspectives, which is taking place today and tomorrow at the University of Zurich. It is one of the guiding aims of our association, DemocracyNet, to uh, promote interdisciplinary discussions among junior researchers, namely PhD students and postdocs, um, about democracy studies, and I believe that we have been having a wonderful start in the workshop today. And I hope that our participants will leave tomorrow evening with new insights on their own research and new ideas for future collaborations. The second aim of DemocracyNet is to contribute to public debates on democracy beyond academic settings, to provide opportunities and spaces to think and discuss about the demands, procedures, actors, ideals, and limits of democracy. Tonight's lecture opens a discussion about a seemingly simple and fundamental question, what is democracy? We're very glad that Jean-Paul Gagnon accepted our invitation to draw on his current and fascinating research project to give some elements of answer to this question. Jean-Paul Gagnon is assistant professor at the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis of the University of Canberra. He's also the co-founder and co-editor of the peer-reviewed journal Democratic Theory and co-edits the Palgrave Macmillan book series, The Theories, Concept, and Practices of Democracy. He received a PhD in political philosophy from Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane for his dissertation focused on endemic problems of democracy and went on to develop his project of cataloging descriptions of democracy as a postdoc in Melbourne before arriving in Canberra. As of yesterday, he has counted 2,530 descriptions of democracy. I therefore learned that democracy can be green, but also red, blue, rainbow, pink, gray or white. <laughs> what does that exactly mean? I will let Jean-Paul answer this question in a minute. In the name of DemocracyNet, I would like to thank the Chair of Political Philosophy, um, Francis Chenneval, who is luckily with us tonight, and the Chair of Democracy Studies and Public Governance of Daniel Kübler of the University of Zurich for their generous support for the organization of this event. The lecture will be followed by an apéro in the cafeteria downstairs, um, which has been sponsored by the peer group of PhD students uh, in political science called Politics, uh, and it's the peer group of the UZH and uh, ETH together. We have had the chance to benefit from Jean-Paul's passion and enthusiasm about the study of democracy during the whole day in our workshops, and it's a real pleasure to give you the floor. Many kind thanks for this wondrous introduction. Uh, having been to the Etik Zentrum, uh, I would gladly come just to work in your gardens. Uh, this is phenomenal. Uh, but we have uh, much work to get through tonight, uh, so let's not tally. How many? It's a simple question of the facts in day-to-day -day life. There's one bicycle in the garage. We are seven guests at dinner, eight if you count the dog, nine if you count the ghost at the uh, extra seating we had last night. There are around eight chestnut tree, 216 owl, 1,200 barnacle, that's a shout out to uh, Darwin, and 150,000 butterfly and moth species presently recorded. How many? It's a question of the empirical bases, exact, minimal or approximate of the realities we share. Let's bring this rudimentary basic question into the study of democracy. Here we aren't concerned with the number of citizens in a demos, politicians in a parliament, the amount of votes cast in an election, nor like mushrooms after the rain, populists after whatever crisis you care to name, 
uh, or other ent well, important topics like these. Rather, our concern is initially with the number of ways the word, the noun, democracy, has been modified by its users in, again, initially, the English language. And why should we ask how many times has the noun democracy been modified over time in the literature presently available to us? Well, the answer to that question brings us to the beginning of a story that I'd like to share with you this evening. It begins with a puzzle, it works through an empirical finding, and ends with an overview of methods, thoughts, and a normative assertion. A wholesome thing for a philosopher or theorist to do. Nespa. So, it's common when laboring in the vineyards of democratic theory, as Robert Dahl put it eloquently, to run into a recurring disclaimer or recognition, one that is especially apparent in the literature. There are many kinds of democracy. There are many descriptions of democracy. There are many concepts, theories, types, definitions, models, understandings, and so forth of democracy. You can find admissions like these in the literature for each decade going back 200 years from today. As can be seen in this slide, even Aristotle was pointing to democracy's plural iterations in the polis of his time. To say, then, that there are many experiences of democracy, to borrow from Giovanni Sartori's phraseology, is effectively a mantra in democracy studies. It's a recurring recognition, a readmission of democracy's ontological pluralism, its kaleidoscope of meanings, its myriad activities, pointed to by its signal words. And here, I'm nodding clearly to Wittgenstein via Pitkin. One of the more prominent sayings in our collection of mantras comes from Dahl, who wrote, there is no democratic theory. There are only theories of democracy. Okay, so how many are there? Well, when you run into this mantra as often as I have, the examples offered here in this slide are but a small selection <laughs> from the instances I recorded along the way. Uh, when you run into them as much as I have, the question beckons. If we know that there are so many experiences of democracy out there, um, if only in the literature available to us, excluding for the time being the wider internet record and information held in the hearts, the minds, and the guts of living, breathing people, uh, these instances of everyday talk, if you like, which still need to be added, well, even in my restricted scenario here, just how many experiences of democracy are there then? That's the question. The answer is, well, we don't know. This left me puzzled. Why couldn't I find the data underpinning the mantra? It confused me to read that an effort was once made to count democratic theories and make sense of them in toto. This was undertaken by Henry Bertram Mayo, one of my countrymen in Canada, when he began writing his foundational text, An Introduction to Democratic Theory, Oxford, 1960, as you know. As Mayo writes, I tried this method at first, but it led only to confusion, and there seemed no end to the undertaking. Instead, therefore, the method chosen is to set up a consistent and coherent theory of democracy, which I hope may command wide though not, of course, unanimous, agreement, and to show here and there how other theories differ from it. The words of Mayo. Not a comprehensive a priori position, something akin to semi-arbitrary uh, starting places in introducing readers to our discipline. There's, of course, also Dahl, who took a different approach in his preface to democratic theory, 1956, Chicago. He states, 
at the outset of his book that it is anomalous, perhaps, that after so many centuries of political speculation, democratic theory should continue to be, if I'm right in my basic assumption, rather unsatisfactory. Whether the theory be regarded as essentially ethical in character or essentially an attempt to describe the actual world. Dahl continues, one of the difficulties one must face at the outset is that there is no democratic theory. There are only democratic theories. This fact suggests that we had better proceed by considering some representative democratic theories in order to discover what kinds of problems they raise. Such a procedure is followed in these essays, the ones he offers in his book, although I have made no effort to survey all or most of the traditional theories about democracy. The words of Dahl. Here too we have an admission like Mayo's and a semi-arbitrary start to thinking about the existing ethical or practical meanings, i.e. expressions, theories, models, and so forth of democracy. But why have two influential figures turned away from the basic labor of taking stock of what exists in terms of democracy's expressions before writing about them? Both Mayo and Dahl recognized democracy's ontological pluralism, but both turned away from it and worked from what they felt to be a consistent and coherent or representative theory of democracy. These two starting points were not as empirically grounded and therefore justifiable as they could have been. They are, in the words of Giovanni Sartori, essentially Mayoian or Dalian me definitions of democratic theory. Why, before writing, didn't they try to get to know democracy better through taking stock of its plural ontologies? It's my contention that it was not feasible to do this work, to count by searching through hundreds of thousands of publications in the late 1950s and early 1960s when Mayo and Dahl were writing their foundational texts. Any such attempt would have seemed, like Mayo asserted, an endless task without the internet, without vast knowledge databases, and without the now relatively inexpensive computing power needed to search through hundreds of millions of pages of texts. As David Held once told me in an interview, democratic theorists have to start somewhere. We have to make do with the tools and the knowledge available to us. Fair enough. But now Sartori enters the scene. His book, The Theory of Democracy Revisited, comes in two volumes, as you know, came decades after Mayo's and Dahl's titles. Sartori took umbrage with the proliferation of adjectives affixed to democracy, especially after 1945. He provokes, are all definitions of democracy arbitrary, he asks, if we don't take words seriously? Can democracy mean just anything, he poses. Now, Sartori, like Collier and Levitsky, Schmitter, Diamond, and others, come across as defenders of minimal proceduralist democracy, also known as liberal democracy in the tradition of Schumpeter, Huntington, Leipart, and they see this as the a priori form of democracy in our modern period from which all other forms of democracy uh, deviate. Right, that, for me, is very clear in the literature. So in reading Sartori, I was saying yes, but also no. Yes, because we need to take the language of democracy seriously because it is a record of democracy's experiences. Words are artifacts, objects fixed in time and space, countable like beetles in a jungle, whose data is readily reproducible by anyone who might care to do so. But no, because I didn't think we should be doing this in a position that presumes a priori knowledge of what democracy is and therefore should be. I believe that we should let the evidence speak for itself, then think about our current political situations, and then theorize from these evidentiary bases. 
but I'm getting ahead of myself. For me, Sartori kickstarted the case of needing to know the extent of democracy's words, its experience carriers, the signals that point to its activities. And here you can hear late Wittgenstein in particular. I think this way because, as I said, recorded language is an artifact. It's empirical and produces data that anyone can use and reproduce independently. It may lessen the arbitrariness of our definitions, this accepted practice of coming up with me definitions without uh, reference to most other empirical knowledge about democracy. But that's uh, less a significant point because I think there's value in the ambivalence of our definitions. Uh, and I'm therefore not one for policing such things or advocating that we do so. Rather, asking how many recorded experiences of democracy are out there in the literature is, in short, an abandoned labor. And therefore, in picking up this work, likely a different means for studying democracy. That, for me, is the barrel of diamonds. For who knows what taking this empirical, word-based approach to studying democracy will reveal. But this is uh, maybe not a sufficient justification for re-pursuing the work that Mayo in particular left behind. There are, of course, more pressing reasons for resuming this work. Think of Melia Kirke's objection to the way certain models of democracy have been valorized over others in the world of foreign aid and internationally assisted democratization. It's practically common knowledge now that a significant number of people on the receiving end of so-called export democracy uh, resent the process and would prefer to democratize on their own, away from hegemons and their interests. Just think of uh, Chirac's famous line from a TV discussion uh, about the invasion of Iraq. We don't export democracy in armored vans. Knowing more and knowing differently about democracy can empower Kirkies on the ground Democrats to unleash, as Michael Sayward is terming it and I think hoping it, their act of democratic design. The anthropologist Julia Foley offers support for this viewpoint when she wrote back in 2002 that anthropologists regularly document expressions of democracy in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and so forth that are different from the liberal democratic form emergent in the third wave, but that are importantly no less valid than the model espoused by Washington or Brussels or Moscow or Beijing, if you like because they are grassroots. They are kinds of democracy emergent from the thoughts and actions of people thinking together, acting together, locals trying to express their sovereign power, trying to figure out how to be Democrats and govern themselves. So there's too an emancipatory justification for this basic work of counting words. Now comes a trickier question. And this question I draw from Kirky in particular. Tricky because it turns the gaze on ourselves. Are we, scholars of democracy, complicit in this behavior, in unintentionally valorizing one or more models of democracy out of ignorance? This was, for me anyway, a compelling question. Shouldn't we be trying to understand all of democracy's experiences. Caveat emptor, this will probably never be a finished project, and that's a good thing. And to work on, with, through, against, and in relation to them, to this whole that we continuously chase across languages. Perhaps most particularly in our efforts to solve today's democracy problems. Here we're starting to get the idea of these experiences, these lessons forgotten as tools but we'll come back to that. It's for these reasons in particular, uh, therefore, that I came to fully believe that we should try to count democracy's words, its experience carriers, its signals, and as I said, not only that in the academic literature. Uh, we should also be looking 
uh, at everyday talk. Recorded talk, so it's already factual. Good. So we finished with our disclaimers. We can move on to part two. We're all in agreement about counting, the importance of counting, returning to a project, a program that was uh, left behind, if you like. Well, what do we count? It was Collier and Levitsky's finding of 550 subtypes of democracy, as they termed it, that gave me the idea of where to start or what to count. For, I said, in the first moment uh, when I got to that section of their paper, here at long last is the corpus I've been looking for. Uh, far more elegant phrasing than what actually happened in my head at the time. Uh, but it wasn't to be. Collier and Levitsky analyzed 150 studies on democracy and had pulled the 550 nouns of democracy with their modifier adjectives uh, out of them. So it was not a demonstration of democracy's ontological pluralism as it exists in the extant literature. And their data was also generated to serve a powerful example um, of the dangerous proliferation of what they saw as anomalous conceptions of democracy, conceptions that deviated from the liberal democratic theory of third wave Anglo-American modernist ambitions. In Larry Diamond's words, Collier and Levitsky, like Sartori, were trying to save this theory of democracy from death by a thousand subtractions. Lovely phrase. So their finding was not speaking from the literature writ large. It was speaking to an a priori theoretical design. The first I was looking for, and the second I'm still trying to avoid, as I believe we've done enough speaking about a body of knowledge we've never properly described. My preference is, if at all possible, to let the evidence that I find speak for itself. And any fans of Walter Benjamin's in the room will uh, appreciate what I'm saying. That said, Collier and Levitsky's work was instructive, specifically because it led me to read more around the debate between democracy with and without adjectives. Adjectives, at least in the English language, matter. They serve as the chief modifiers of nouns and are, therefore, worth counting in relation to the noun democracy. Pace, uh, those who pull their hair out over democracy with adjectives, uh, I'm not saying qualifiers aren't used by authoritarian tricksters. This has happened for decades and continues to happen. I'm saying that adjectives are a place to start in counting democracy's experiences couched as they are in the extant literature. This could very well help us better understand and therefore resist the sophistry uh, involved in democracy's language games. So I began with recording pre-positive and pre-nominal adjectival pairings like liberal democracy, representative democracy, deliberative democracy, and so on, and post-positive or post-nominal pairings, such as democracy light, democracy 2.0, and democracy interrupted. You know, all real things. I thought that this was a good method to start with because adjectives uh, are commonly used as noun modifiers, and therefore they should give a reliable, minimal indication of democracy's ontological pluralism as it is recorded in the literature. And here I'm pretty much stuck with Google Scholar, Google Books, and Microsoft Academic as the main uh, data bases I was working through. So I've so far recorded 2,530. As of today, it's 2,533. Thank you to my colleagues in the workshop for adding uh, these new ones to the database. Uh, real existing adjectival pairings, with more to come as I've not yet included uh, evidence outside of those three corpora. Let's take a quick look at some of the A, Bs, and Cs involved here. Be forewarned, though, we will experience some text overload in this Cook's tour of observations and questions that jump out of the next few slides. I invite you, therefore, to jump along with me. Uh, I will settle down shortly as we move into the next section of this talk, which uh, looks at how we can use the data. Okay, first with the A's. Here we have abolitionist democracy. 
which points readers to how some people banded together to protest, to become arrested in the struggle to end slavery. How did they organize? Were they part of an underground of resistance alongside those forced into slavery? Are there lessons here to help Democrats free women, children, and young persons in modern slavery? Here we have a good run of polity-specific pairings, Alaskan, Albanian, Albertan, Algerian. What is democracy like in those places? Are they comparable? Do they have similar problems? Might they support each other's or do damage to each other's democratic regime? Are there any places in the world not recorded? Answer, there are, especially cities, and should they therefore be recorded if they're left out? Here, we then have anti-aristocratic and anti-bourgeois democracy. Are these two terms going to mean roughly the same as Bolshevik or proletarian democracy? Are these concepts subtypes of communist democracy? Could they all be brought together in a family of meaning? Aryan democracy, starkly racist, connoting aspects of white democracy. Should it be removed from the database as an ineligible concept of democracy due to its repugnant racist overtones and historical association with Nazism. But, lo, what of Aryan democracy in India? The signifier of centralized traditional authority which is resisted by the decentralized panchayat democracy practiced in many Indian villages. Should this aspect of the concept be kept in the database or the corpus if you like and the Nazi aspect cast out? And who decides this? Following on, there's a semantic question of whether abused and abusive democracy should be joined together, given their written similarity. Alas, no. Because what if one democracy is abusing another? Melding the two would be logically inconsistent, as we cannot mash the experience of the abuser with the experience of the abused. Let's jump to the bees. Ballot and bullet democracy brings to the fore a tension between elections in Palestine that tended to favor the incumbent and where <laughs> some in the community therefore felt ballot boxes were forms of violence in their own right and were challengeable by bullets, hard violence, as the only means for the opposition to be heard. Baobab tree democracy, like its neighbor in the list here, banyan tree democracy, points out how some people imbued a type of tree with symbolic significance. In our culture, this is the type of tree that we meet under to discuss collective matters. Big top democracy. This one's obscure, used only once. It's part of a phrase in a poem by African-American poet Melvin B. Tolson, involving, of all things, Liberia, high-ranking officials, circus-like politics, hence the big top, and the Cold War. Blacksmith democracy has, as far as I can find, only been used once again in October 1921 in a publication called The Survey from the USA. Here the author writes that on the anvils of our Springfield blacksmiths are being hammered out new Damascus blades far keener and more supple than of old, the blades of a new democracy, alert, devout, patriarchal, artistic, American. Where is this coming from? What does it mean? Has it anything to do with guild democracy? Brittle democracy seems to explain itself. But then again, what's brittle? And in which democracy? Conversely, what's strong democracy? And in this context, uh, why is it strong? How does it compare to the many other accounts we can read in the literature using these concepts? Bullshit democracy, great protest exclaimer. But is the sayer, the yeller of this term, actually talking of democracy or perhaps of something else? For example, the misfirings of an outmoded electoral system. Is this incorrect conflation between the idea of democracy and the pathology of a specific type of electoral democracy problematic? Is it dangerous? <sighs> then, of course, there's between elections democracy, a wonderful signal for all that happens or should happen democratically after the ballots have rung their final bell. How are we doing, folks? Overwhelmed yet? OK, now to the seas, but uh, much quicker this time. We've got uh, carbon, Cherokee, Coca-Cola, 
coffee, coffee table, uh, constipated, convict, and coolie democracy. Each like the unders, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was going to my German, the unders, uh, A and B tell their own story. They raise their own questions, and of course prompt us toward the need for sense making. But just to complete this uh, intended effect, and this was intentional, uh, this emotional experience of avalanche by real information, we have to make the recognition that there are still more than 23 pages like this to go through. Uh, and that's only counting what I've gone through so far. There's still probably two or three times as many, I'm guessing, uh, artifacts out there to be collected. So when I think of this information and remind myself that it's not all made up, but real and located in books and papers, magazines, forums, social media posts, and news media, eventually, that is, once I break out of my bad academic habits, uh, that I can touch and share. I feel like an archaeologist at the foot of a mountain of vases, statues, cracked murals, broken figurines, rotten boats, <laughs> ancient coins, dinosaur bones, paintings of the future, and so on. So. Democracy's ontological pluralism, even in just this first incomplete finding, really is overwhelming. So where does everything we've so far been through together this evening leave us? Well, for one, what this demonstrates is that the mantra is true. Uh, we've had it right all along, although I think some scholars would be dismayed by the extent of this phenomenon that we are recording. I've presented earlier versions of this work, mind you, not, uh, not as developed. This is my first time speaking uh, with this uh, paper. As this catalog of democracy's adjectival pairings right, was, was growing, uh, and I've been called uh, the destroyer of democracy, relativism's agent number one, uh, a mere butterfly collector, a rag picker, uh, and a stooge to empiricism. Now, mind you, that was by my friends. Uh, and whilst I agree that what I'm doing at the moment is basic research, a project that I see Mayo as having abandoned some 70 years ago, and that it may look anti-theoretical at the outset, uh, I vigorously deny that this is one, a threat to democracy, and two, a triumph for relativism. To the first charge, I respond, and will show in the next section of this talk, that studying democracy's real existing ontological pluralism its experiences which we are pointed to time and again uh, by adjectival pairings, uh, but also synonyms, but that's for a different data set, enriches democracy and offers up a vibrant city of knowledge to study and to study in, which might serve as a means to help combat the pretender democracies, those two-faced oxymoronic charlatan concepts, which serve to let authoritarianism, unfreedom, and despotism pass us by in Democrats' clothing. To the second charge, I'm not saying, here, look now, democracy means everything and anything, and I've just the ridiculously long list to prove it. Uh, no, not only does such a position not hold water under scrutiny, it's also the opposite of my intention. What I am saying is here, look now, we were right in our presumption. There's lots to study here. What does it all mean? What can we do with it? What I believe this evidence does is offer us an update to knowledge about democracy. It is merely an open invitation for us to come to better know our subject matter. It shows that the evidence whose shadow uh, has lain in our collective psyche for centuries is real and can now be more fully appreciated. As I will move on to show, I think uh, this evidence can help us understand more about the philosophy of democracy, and I say that intentionally, about how the evidence can be used and, through its uses, allow us to understand more about the nature of knowledge relating to this thing we call democracy. Okay, so on to uses. Thinking back to the observations and questions we quickly zipped through, one of the most obvious things we can do with this data is to mine it. 
to dive into one of the adjectival pairings and to see where it leads us. In mining, we are digging for information. For example, when I ran into brown democracy, I began reading into its few sources. I uncovered a remarkable story about a former World War II uh, Filipino journalist turned military officer turned political theorist. That's a career. Uh, his name was Carlo P. Romulo, and he argued how Western colonialism and Japanese imperialism served to unite people across Asia into a pan-Asian, transboundary racial democracy premised on the emancipation of colored peoples. It was his silver democratic lining to what he called the Japanese debacle. Mining can also lead to uncovering other adjectival pairings. For instance, after reading Into Brown Democracy, I wondered, as Alice mentioned earlier, uh, if there were other colors associated with uh, democracy in the literature, and found many. There's black democracy, green democracy, pink democracy, that's from Japan, blue, yellow, gray, rainbow, and these signals all pointed to their own stories, to their own records of activities. We can also look for the antonyms for a concept, like representative and unrepresentative democracy uh, when mining, and also search for its synonyms, such as indirect, uh, democracy at a distance, and rep, it's a thing, rep democracy, uh, as synonyms for representative uh, here, which would also be a useful exercise if your aim was to construct a family uh, of meaning between like concepts, which could bring uh, more order to the databases, grouping, aggregating, clustering meaning is a useful simplifying device. Seeking meaning in an adjectival pairing may lead to finding no meaning and therefore opening the door to removing the pairing from the corpus because it's a throwaway line. But then again, who's to decide this? Maybe it's just another term for a neologism waiting to happen. Meaning might also stir up controversy and debate, such as with Aryan democracy or with terms that some say are contradictory, charlatan concepts designed to fool us, like illiberal democracy, authoritarian democracy, and despotic democracy. Should these concepts be removed from the corpus and be added to some Orwellian list of non-democracy or to a Sartorian list of confused democracy? Mining is, in short, one fruitful means of using the data. Another means of using the data involves taxonomies. I was curious to know, for example, how Lincolnian democracy was used in the literature, so I organized all of its available mentions in the literature on a time scale, and then searched the reference lists of each publication, there was over 90, uh, to see if there was a citation network in place. None was found. Instead, the term seems to have been used independently across the last 90 or so years, and this is reflected in the many different meanings the term is semantically linked to. So there's no one narrative for Lincolnian democracy, rather an unlinked scattering of uses that a scholar can pull together and flesh out uh, in a paper or book, and obviously be sensible about it. You can look at Lincoln's democracy as another body of literature, uh, and so forth, work through it that way. Thinking taxonomically also beckons us to wonder about the whole this is especially evident uh, if you've read Franco Moretti's books on his uh, distant reading methods. Once all of the literature associated with each adjectival pairing is scanned in optical character recognition file format and entered into the database with plenty of associated detail, we'll be able to unleash the might of computing software to better understand how democracy's ontological pluralism grew over time, where for whom, uh, when, and so forth. Well, so I said time twice, so there you go. Uh, that's a large part of the second stage in my research program. This evening we're focusing on the first part of the first stage. The database, as it stands, prompts us to think about which of these, or other, experiences of democracy are present in the minds and in the hands of people living in the polity of your choice.
through a survey, it could be possible to detect a blend of these theories existing among the demos. Studying how and among whom, and consequently where these theories clash and come together, may very well be a, a useful way of understanding the nature of that polity's democracy. You can, of course, track this over time through recurring surveys and compare different polities. Now, of course, VDEM, varieties of democracy, are, uh, I think, heading down this path, but it's uh, difficult to know because they're only measuring a handful of, uh, um, well, arguably more operational models of democracy. Okay, how are we doing for time, Alice? Yeah? We come to the last uh, means of usage, and I just want to spend a little bit more time here, so I, I beg your forgiveness for hopping around as I have, uh, because there was just so much to say. So if there's anything I've glossed over, uh, please just come back and fire away in uh, the question time. So the last uh, example of the, uh, the database's utility comes from Tocqueville, and here I beg your pardon again for writing on your rooftops. Um, I got the idea of visualizing knowledge about democracy uh, as a city from Tocqueville, as I explain in a short video I put together especially for this occasion. The two key things to note before we watch, the frequency of use of adjectival pairings in the database can be approximated uh, using tailored and complicated Java programs. If anyone's interested in this, I have the working paper and I also have the JavaScript programs with instructions from my very talented, hocus pocus capable research assistant. Um, so for example, American democracy has been used in hundreds of thousands of publications. It's an approximation, it's an estimate. Whilst Prussian democracy has been used in only a dozen or so publications. Therefore, when I see a big building in Zurich, I see a prominent theory of democracy. Middle size to smaller buildings are less prominent, i.e. less frequently used theories. Notice how there are many more of the lesser prominent ones even in this photo. This is uh, the bulk of uh, models that I've recorded so far and ranked. That's where they fall in this middle pack. The second thing to recognize is that some adjectival pairings have distinct subtypes. Think of liberal representative, constitutional representative, transparent representative, uh, and so on, uh, uh, democracy. So prior to making the video, I thought of these subtypes as rooms inside the building of representative democracy, that some, whoever wrote the papers that use these words would be locked in this type of endless walk, the scriptors, right? When we publish some kind of piece of us, explain it however you like, I use a Harry Potter metaphor of horcruxes, um, but we are locked in this movement, if you like. Uh, so we might be in one room if we published one thing relative to that, but we can go over scriptor theory. It's not my own work, it's uh, from another uh, in Q&A time. Good. So. Let's uh, let's watch this film. Uh, and I do beg uh, your pardon. <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing this. Shortly after Tocqueville's return from America in the United States, he had so much data that he collected, he couldn't really make head or tails of it. And as the story goes, it took him eight years to collect this information in his mind. And he did so through metaphor. One of those metaphors is quite powerful. He started to think about all of his notes as a city of knowledge. He wanted to be like a traveler to a great city to look at its buildings, to meet its people, to get a sense of what this information looked like when he walked away from it. So I'm going to try to do the same here in Zurich while starting in Erichen from the lovely hotel that the University of Zurich booked for me, thank you very much, and to walk through the city, to walk around the city and head up to Oetliberg to be, or to try to be, 
uh, like Tocqueville's metaphorical traveler. What buildings will I come across? Who will want to <laughs> talk to me as I bombard them with questions uh, from left field? What can I approximate in this space, in this lived environment, to the knowledge of democracy? Or at least the minimal approximation of knowledge that I've collected so far. From the English language, these adjectival pairings, what are we going to find? Well, let's go and find out. A boy is born in hard time, Mississippi. So I'm still uh, just on the fringes of the city in Erlikon, I think. And it struck me that there's actually a lot of substance here. I mean, I haven't seen any of the big uh, buildings yet. None of the big churches, uh, although I passed one by that was quite uh, elegant looking and quite uh, substantial in size. But most of what I'm seeing are these types of three or four story houses um, with nice flats, uh, lots of people about riding their bicycles, uh, lots of different uh, economic conditions, although I'm not sure if that has bearing <laughs> in this metaphor. Uh, but I'm drawn in. I'm drawn into these buildings. I'm wondering, what is the story of this house? Is this perhaps something like uh, brown democracy? Or is this perhaps uh, something less known? Maybe one of the smaller uh, homes. Uh, and I'm not sure if there are enough sub-categories or sub-concepts to fit the metaphor already because I'm not sure if there's going to be this many rooms in, in smaller edifices. Um, it strikes me that the smaller buildings would be perhaps just one, one big room filled with literature. Um, but yes, this is just a, a thought in passing. By four walls and ain't so His parents give him I'm getting closer to the city centre now where I'm expecting to find at least most of the biggest buildings or, if you like, the core of knowledge about uh, democracy. And I've noticed that there's more economical business happening here. That you've got more shop fronts. And it struck me that there are certain forms of democracy that lend themselves more towards uh, the business of democracy. Representative democracy, electoral democracy, these things connote uh, the service of voting, of elections. Then you've got deliberative democracy or discursive democracy. And already we have businesses and foundations providing this as a service uh, to typically government bodies, but now increasingly private uh, firms doing marketing. You've also got radical democracy. I mean, somebody has to feed the protesters, right? Taking a bit of a break here at the, uh, the lovely Migro. I mean, I'm sure Tocqueville needed uh, some sustenance along his way. Uh, and I'm struck by a couple of quick thoughts. One, there's definitely a much closer gender parity to this city that I've seen, and we just don't see that in uh, the scripters in the city of democracy. It's far outweighed by men and typically uh, so-called Western or Eurocentric or just old white guys. Um, so that's definitely something that's not coming together. Uh, the other, though, has to do with streets and the volume of cars that go down them and also trams and buses. Are these similar to the main narratives that we have in knowledge about democracy? Things constructed by those with wealth and influence or perhaps even just by chance. And that was our convention, as happens from time to time in uh, typically wilder places where people find their own way and then others fall into those tracks. Uh, and those are the, the ways that we go about uh, geographical scapes, geographical knowledge, a different form of knowledge. Well, time for a bun. Love and affection To keep him strong Moving in the right direction Living just enough Just enough for the city
the city. This sister's black, but she is showing up pretty. Her skirt is short, but Lord, her legs are steady. Just to walk to school, she got to get up early. Her clothes are old, but never are they dirty. So I'm very nearly to the top of this here pear mountain, and I'm pretty certain Talk Phil, the aristocrat, the delicate as he was, ain't done nothing like climbing his metaphor. I mean, at least not here. Goodness, it seems to me that this mountain exists to torture the locals kill visitors, and all for the amusement of here Mountain God. Oh. Smart, he's got more sense than many. His fish is long, but soon he won't have any. Just to find a job is like a haystack needle. Cause where he live, they don't use colored people living just enough. I'd finally made it to the top. In hindsight, I grossly overestimated the work involved in trying to bring Tocqueville's metaphor to practiced life, but it was well worth the effort. Thoughts kept jumping to mind as I walked. Is a scripter's choice in transportation like a scholar's choice in methodology? Are traffic lights like university funding? Is the existence of non-human forms of life an acceptable expression of non-human democracy, which has a special library of its own? And what about all the kids in Zurich? The age of scriptures in the city of democracy would surely be skewed to the older side of things. Alas, maybe the point of democracy in America, of Tocqueville's special adventure, was to raise more questions than it could ever hope to answer. I guess maybe that's the true value of democracy's many expressions across time, across space, maybe even across culture. Just enough, uh, just enough for the city. I'm not sure what was happening with the video. Um, it was a bit of a surreal film moment, which, uh, anyway, we can talk about that uh, later. There's, of course, surrealist democracy. Um, but let me, let me regain my composure. Uh, whew, okay. As the sun began to set over the picturesque Utlibeg, I felt the city beckoning again, in part because I was desperately tired and wanting sleep. Uh, so I descended um, the way I came uh, on Lanternbeg through Oetlibergstrasse uh, and onward to Erlichen uh, via Langstrasse with its boisterous revelers inside bars and restaurants after dusk. And although more thoughts had struck me along the way, such as uh, what an abandoned building might mean the literature, an abandoned theory, perhaps, and if that's true, then there'd be many. Um, but it was the darkness that left the most significant impact on me in this attempt to live Tocqueville's metaphor. As darkness overcame the city, the buildings, i.e. the experiences of democracy, lost their distinctiveness, and there were fewer people, i.e. scripters, the, the ghosts of the authors that exist after we publish around. Texture, detail, difference. 
became washed by the black and white and gray sfumato of the night. This monochrome condition made it very difficult to see and therefore think about the vibrantly plural nature of the city, of knowledge about democracy. Do we, humans, most people including researchers, do we see democracy like this in monochrome? I think we may. Because at minimum, to begin seeing democracy in fuller color, we have to first know what's out there. Basic research, as simple as it is, lights knowledge up and beckons welcome to any of those interested. And with all of this now said and done, I think we could very well use quite a bit more of it. Thank you. like to sit down, Jean-Paul, after this? Uh, well, or can you stand? I think we both have to be on the mic. Um, yes. Are there questions? Or are you all under the impression of this very experimental talk? Uh, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the mic is arriving for you. Hi, uh, thanks, Don Paul. I, I really enjoyed the the lecture. Uh, it's the first time I, I hear you talk about this extensively, and it's really fascinating. Um, my question was, why is the question, how many, um, you know, how many terms of democracy are there, and not which terms? I mean, how what is the relevance of the number? I think there might be a relevance that you have in mind. So I'm just curious. Sorry, I, I was under the impression we were collecting. Um, yeah, it, I, mean, I mean, again, we're in the first stage of the first part of this program that I've set out. Um, and it is fundamentally, it must be about how many. Uh, because I don't want to go and start making designs. I know that sounds a bit naive. We all carry with us the baggage of our own you know, ethics and, and desires and hypotheses. And, and pets, right? Um, but I think the question of which comes after, not, not necessarily after because there will never be a stop to counting. Uh, you know, we'll reach some kind of a threshold and then we can move on to starting to flesh out, you know, the, the publications that use each of these terms and then start getting this into uh, a format that we can really look at using some very nice impressive software. Um, to do close readings, if you like, or distant readings, uh, and then we start to ask the questions of which. Which ones are here? Which ones are more valuable than others? Which ones are just <laughs> amazing and we've forgotten about them? And you get this sense of glee, of uh, frisson, <laughs> when you start reading about them, because you don't find them in textbooks. You don't find them. These are things that are coming from the, the new. They're coming from, <laughs> uh, I guess, well, maybe our detritus. Maybe I am a rag picker. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, you said that the number show which one were m most valuable, and I think maybe it's it show which one are most valued by people. But it doesn't mean that they are more valuable in themselves first. And uh, taking back your metaphor about buildings, I mean, there are millions of types of buildings and millions of ways of describing them. But when we are speaking about building, everybody knows what a building is. So there is a kind of common core. And is it not the same for democracy? Oh, we're going back to that chestnut. <laughs> OK, yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> you use the building <laughs> metaphor, so. No, no, look, uh, let's start with the buildings. Uh, so again, that's not my metaphor. I've pinched it from Tocqueville. Right? Um, and as you could tell, I was having uh, this conversation 
with myself through the editing process, which happened, thank you very kindly, uh, at a desk by uh, uh, Alice's, overlooking the gorgeous gardens. Um, but it, the metaphor only works to a certain grain. I mean, when you start to really look into the detail, yes, you can start to get some pretty good questions generating, and it, and it makes for really good thinking about the, the nature of knowledge about democracy. But if you go any further, you try to stick what we know already into, let's say, Zurich, as the structure, as the backdrop, as the, the being of the, the, the metaphor, then it does start to, uh, to fall apart. So I would, I'd say you'd have to take this in, in broad strokes. Uh, for that, you know, I, well, I wasn't saying that these are buildings, we know what buildings are, these are 2,000 whatever democracies, and we know what democracy is, no, not at all. These are symbols. The big building has thousands, hundreds of thousands of publications associated to it. That's why I went to the, uh, the wonderful, beautiful, double-towered uh, church in the, the main square, because that, to me, was reflective of uh, American democracy and its prominence in, um, in, in knowledge. Um, but I think that question is more of a provocation, Victor. Yeah. Uh, value. Can, could you please restate the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you said that the n number makes, I, I mean, you, you talk about valuable form of democracy, democracy in function of the number. And I was thinking maybe American democracy uh, appears many times, but it doesn't mean that oh it's most yeah, valuable. Okay. I mean, it mi no, no, might I be I most valued by people, but not valuable in itself. And just to, to come back about the, the, the building metaphor, I mean, sometimes it's not the, the big building that are the most important. Maybe sometimes public bathrooms yeah. are more yes. important than, I don't know, <laughs> churches or something, <laughs> somehow. Um, le let me, uh, so I, I first I beg your, your uh, pardon if I miscommunicated. I'm not saying that the higher the number, the more valuable. And I did not say that anywhere. Uh, it is strictly a matter of frequency. That's all. It's a, it's a value-free judgment. And I, as I tried to express in responding to Hans's question, there are so many of these medium and even single-use occasions, like uh, uh, what was a lovely story, Waldorf democracy, used once. And that was in 1920-some-odd. I mean, I wrote a, a blog about it. It's on the interwebs. Um, but it was a, such a nice uh, explanation of what the Waldorf Astoria in New York City did. Uh, it held a big dinner in honor of its employees, people who worked there for 10 years or longer. And the guests of honor were the longest serving people. Half of those seats were reserved to the princes of industry, to the, uh, to the aristocracy, the elite, that had fond memories of the Waldorf. So they were, I mean, this is a journalist's account, not mine. They were sitting next to, you know, you might have the owner of all the, the trains, let's pretend this is Monopoly, and <laughs> sitting next to a busboy. And then the keynote speaker is, is not some, uh, well, you know, pretender such as myself, but someone who's actually worked, put in 40 years as the, at the bar. He was the bartender. He was the soul of the place. That is such a magnificent story, and then it made me wonder, where are these instances now? Where do we have these uh, dinners in honor of working people? where the rich, the wealthy, the influential come to celebrate them. And this edifice, this service, this institution, they've worked to build and enjoy together. C'est magnifique. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ola. <laughs> Still up front with the microphone. Thank you very much for your, your talk and it's very interesting paper you, you gave us. Uh, I have some kind of a experimental question, which is um, with this metaphor of buildings, uh, we see concepts as something that is, are just like um, buildings that people go through and stuff like that. But the thing is sometimes concepts are just transferred to other contexts mm -hmm. and during the process of transferring uh, this concept, we sometimes empty of its real meaning, mm -hmm. uh, this concept. And also over time, we have transformation of words. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't occur, sometimes it occurs. For instance, the word discrete uh, in during the Middle Age means wise people, discrete mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Now it means someone who is just uh, discrete, just mm -hmm. tries just to be 
aloof or just uh, don't be seen. So how do you deal with this kind of uh, different way to see concepts? Sure, thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is through taxonomies. So let's say you'll go with, uh, I, I'm presuming there's discrete democracy. Uh, you pop over to the earliest available mentions. Again, uh, we're dealing with approximations. To say otherwise is uh, foolery. You get the available uh, mentions, lay them out, go to the earliest, start looking at what connections they might have. Some works actually might be citing uh, a book or a paper or, or a, an article that's not uh, actually using the exact words. So there is linkages outside of the uh, um, this chain of, of well, breadcrumbs, if you like, the trail. And then you will get to see, this is just uh, what will happen, you will see that meaning starts to change. As I said with Lincolnian democracy, uh, it had you know over, I think, 12 or 13, I can't remember what I wrote in the paper, um, uh, different meanings attributed to it. And then you start to map these out. You start to look at, well, why, why did that happen this time and space? And you start to form the roots and the webs and start going out. So for me, that's, that's how I would go and start to understand the normal, sensible change, the evolution of a, of a term over time as it's you know, given meaning at one point, emptied out, put in with another, maybe blended. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose, you know, we just won't know what value will come out of doing that just at a random chance. Like Mike Sayward said on his talk with Democratic Design in London last week, for him, I, I presume it would be good enough to go to a fishbowl. Imagine cutting up all of these thousands of adjectives. And just lucky dip. See what you get this week or this month to study. All right. Uh, some of my students have said that that's value enough. That this is just a you know, uh, knowledge is chance, and you you never know what you might uncover. I mean, Waldorf democracy that was a that was a fluke, right? Just like the name, Brown democracy as well. That an acceptable answer, HP. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you wouldn't let me off the hook. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I have a two, two questions. One is, uh, when I listened to you, it made me think of Aristotle's method of topoi. You know, when he when he attacks the subject matter, he he looks at how we. Talk about it in ordinary language, and and he collects the topoi. That's I think that's what you do. Uh, um, is that is that correct? Uh, are you giving us a, an Aristotelian topology of, of democracy? Uh, that that will be my first question. The question that would follow um, is where do you go from from there? I can see it's a heuristic. You come across uh, forgotten descriptions of manifestations of, of democratic experiences, instances. And uh, it has a heuristic value because you you find forgotten narratives about about democracy. But um, when you talk about a philosophical investigation, I think the next step would be you look for common uh, commonalities in in those um, descriptions, and you look for mutually exclusive ways of conceiving of democracy. And then um, you might end up with a an endeavor that approaches uh, the dolls and, and others uh, um, when they single out the core meaning uh, of democracy, w would you be willing to go there or do you just want to stay with the heuristic uh, narratives and find ever more different instances of democracy and be, be more of a descriptive guy than a philosophical analytical mm -hmm. investigator? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for both questions. Uh, well, to the first, I mean, I think I've always naturally tended more to Aristotle than Plato. Um, and to colleagues of mine that would say there's ideal forms or an ideal form out there, you'll only ever find plural <laughs> claims to the ideal. So it's plural either way you go. Uh, I need to go back to my, uh, my uh, undergraduate readings to brush up on Topoi. Um, what I'm familiar with is, is Aristotle's claim uh, that there are many kinds of democracy and they come, uh, the translation I got is a bit dated, but in rough English it was, they come from the things which have been said. So presumably the, the decisions made orally by the demoi in one or another uh, of the, the city-states 
you know, that were influential and existing during his time. Um, so I think uh, that would have to be my answer until I can read up properly. Can I follow this up with you via email? Okay, thank you. Um, the second, I, I agree. I mean, uh, my intention at first is to first collect, and then it's to study. Uh, so it is, at the very beginning, a descriptive uh, project, because it must be. Uh, as I've done my best to lay out what we've kind of laid aside for a while, we need to return to this descriptive uh, aspect of trying to understand democracy. But the next stage of the project, once we've reached, as I said, some threshold, and we start to flesh all of those, uh, um, let's say, signal words out with their respective literatures, then we can start to go and start and, and, and look for meaning and look for mutual exclusivity. Uh, and then we can start to build grander narratives. We can also do this in other languages. We can start doing cross-linguistic comparisons. We can start to build, if you like, a more linguistically ecumenical uh, understanding of what we think knowledge is about democracy, at least in the, in the artifactual written uh, sense. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, I'll ask a question. Uh, yeah, sorry if I jumped in on anyone there. Um, just um, quickly, you said with regards that there was a tran you you obviously it was a tran working from a translation, and um, the Aristotle. And I was wondering to what effect you've had, or to what um, degree you've had to deal with kind of looking at translations um, of uh, of. In, in different languages, especially because I saw there are, I think I saw um, Armenian democracy and then Calif I mean, Californian democracy would, would be in English, but the, these kind of geographical um, adjectives to describe democracy and what have you, I mean, I think you're probably still on the English language at the moment, but have you thought about that or is that going to pose a challenge? Thank you, Jack, for the question. It, it certainly is a challenge. I mean, for those of you who have heard me speak German, it's uh, not good. Um, and uh, look, the, the only hope I have is that, you know, this, the work that we do and, and in uh, smaller, more intimate settings, the conversations that we have, uh, maybe this is something that, you know, we'd like to talk about. Maybe this is something that others might find valuable in their own native languages. And uh, I've got this image up behind me on purpose, uh, it's not meant to be a uh, shameless advertisement because this has nothing to do with me. It is my, I'm founding this institute, it's a cloud institute for the philosophy of democracy. Um, but it's not about me, I'm a vector. I said to uh, Alice, I'm a virus. I carry uh, only things without knowing what I'm doing. Um, but the whole point is, the, the ambition here is that at the third phase, we'll be able to open this up so that anyone whichever language they want to work in, can come in and start uh, you know, building their own collection, start f uh, fleshing out their own respective literatures associated with each of the terms that exist uh, in their corpus. And then we can start to do this type of bigger wiki um, uh, work. And anyone who was here at the PDA in London, uh, at the Participedia uh, round table or semicircle, <laughs> knows that uh, Participedia was absolutely formative in thinking this way. They are my Argonauts. They are the ones that pushed off from the shore. They are the ones who started to say, hang on a second, why are we writing about participation in the same way that we've always have been for, let's say, the last 50 years, when there's so much else out there? Why don't we try to crowdsource it? I'm not yet at crowdsourcing. I think I want to keep this more uh, in-house, so to speak. Um, but they were, they were marvelous. They're really, these are the trailblazers, and consequently, like a parasite, I am learning off of them. <laughs> Hi, um, welcome first year, and thanks for the talk. So my question is that um, I was fascinated when I saw that um, there's like above 2,500 adjectives with democracy. So um, what, I, what I thought about democracy so far is that it's something that, okay, majority decides what's, what will happen next, right? I mean, as simple as it is, that's what I knew 
um, about what democracy is. Do you mean that democracy is rather something that's not, that is undescribable or something that cannot fit into a box or um, do you mean that it's not as simple as it is, you know, that the majority decides what happens or mm -hmm. like what was the point with the thing that there's a lot of edge actors with the um, democracy? Sorry, could you just say the last bit again? I misheard. Yeah, yeah. What was um, the point of? What was the point of, um, like, it isn't the research that you made, but apparently people all over the academic papers have described democracy in a, like, um, vast range of, um, in, in a very different ways, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. so many adjectives. Um, what do you think the point of doing, doing that? Um, do you mean, do, do they mean that Democracy is undescribable, or sure. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Vulcan. Tell me again. Your your name, Vulcan. Um, Haki. Ha oh, okay. I'll practice that. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing I would say is, democracy is surely not uh, undescribable. That's uh, you know, very much against anything that I'm trying to do. Uh, in fact, I think, and this happened in some conversations that we had here at the Democracy Net uh, discussion. I'm really not doing well with my words today. Um, we, we've talked about it before, and the, what I think may happen, one of my hypotheses, is that once we've you know, collected a lot more information about democracy and we start doing these distant readings and close readings and we start looking across languages, we will probably get what uh, some other people call a clustering effect of the basic minimums of the meanings of democracy, and you'll probably see that cluster change as you go through the timescape. And you may even see it change as you go through uh, different geo uh, geographic scapes. Now, um, why why are these people writing so differently? And that's up to us to find out. Um, it, you know, I can't answer that question. It's probably 10, 20, 30 years away from me. <laughs> I understand. Thank um, you very much. Oh, oh, no worries. Well, And, and uh, I would just say, the, the last thing I would like to mention with that is, and I have, I've been bugging my very patient colleagues today with these uh, provocations. When one speaks about democracy, I'm because of, of being exposed to this information, I'm always situating. Um, and I have seven questions that come mainly from uh, Dorenspleet. Uh, she's a marvelous uh, uh, scholar. And it's about the dimensions of democracy. So there's seven of these things, and I run through them. So I've been doing this today with uh, people's papers. And when you say democracy, I go, okay, it can't mean democracy itself in toto. It must mean something situated, some uh, meaning in, a, in time and space among topics, among ethic, among justification, among type of democracy. So I'd say, you know, maybe your initial impression is just majoritarian democracy. One type from, uh, from many, and yeah, it, you know, interesting questions come up as to why it's so common uh, when there's others that maybe not replace, not able to replace uh, majoritarian systems. They're very valuable, very useful, but could be used in different uh, parts of uh, of a polity where majoritarianism is just not as useful. Thank you. Is it time for apéro? <laughs> okay. Uh, could I just go, because uh, I'd like this to be known for the record, how hard I've worked uh, for you people. Um, this is the evidence. It was uh, over 40,000 steps, 30 kilometers, to do this damn lived metaphor, and up and down uh, Utliberg Mountain. It is not a hill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I invite all of you to join us for a glass and something to eat uh, in the cafeteria downstairs um, of the building. Thank you for coming. <laughs>